How do you do? Stories of abused and abandoned children tear at the heart because children can't defend themselves. But in fact, they have a defender with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm that is mighty to rectify. As a child, the man in this story endured rejection and cruelty, but he was recompensed when his heart and mind and life were unshackled. Where are we going, Dad? To the juvenile home to get Neil and Marion. You was there, weren't you? Only till they found me a foster home, and was I glad. Uh, they had no right to take my kids away, put them in that place. It was Mom that called the police and started all this. Well, she's gone now. Good riddance. What happened to the younger kids? They was all adopted out. <gasps> all four of them? All four. Well, I got left is you three. Took me a while to get custody, but I did. Where are we gonna live? With my mom and dad. Because I was drafted. I'm going in the army. Oh, hey, Neil. How are you and your sister getting along with your grandparents? Huh. You're kidding. Uncle John, Grandpa calls us the spawn of the devil. <laughs> well, see, that's because your dad was the black sheep of the family. Well, Grandpa hates us. He makes us stay outside when anybody comes to visit, even you. Well, you won't be here much longer. The war's about over, and your dad will come back and get you. Do you know where Ma is? Nope. Don't care, neither. I ain't seen her since I first went to the juvie home. Well, that was about four years ago, I think. Well, how old are you now, Neil? Not sure. 11 or 12. Well, when's your birthday? I have no idea. Ah, oh, you're kidding. Nobody ever told me, and we never celebrated birthdays or Christmas. Well, I'll find out and let you know. Here you are, Neil. I wrote down your birthday so you don't forget. It's September 11th, and you're 11 years old. Thanks, Uncle John. I guess your big sister is in foster care again. Surely? Yeah, she couldn't take you here with Grandpa. Well, at least you and Marion are still together. She's all I got. We had polio together, and we worked at the juvenile home together, too. Worked hard in farmers' fields. Got us away from the mean people at the home. Bad is here with your Grandpa? Worse. They treated us like trash. Same way Grandpa treats Grandma. Once I saw him beat her and kick her down the basement stairs. Yeah, he's old school. Dad used to beat Ma that way. Because she cheated on him. She didn't have to mistreat us. She called the police on me. Called me a thief because I stole food for the little ones. Is that how you ended up in the juvenile home? Yeah. The cops took me there. We, we didn't have no food in the house and the, and the kids were bawling with hunger. You must have been about seven then. The oldest boy. The man of the family. Yeah. As soon as Dad left for work, Ma took off with her boyfriend. No food in the house, nothing. Your mom and Dad weren't very good parents, Neil. You don't have to tell me that. The little ones are better off in new families. Maybe. But I took care of them. Now, now I'll never see them again. This family disintegrated. And the youth in our story was left to cope without guidance because, well, no one cared. This is his testimony of how that was rectified. The true story of Neil James Westra, right now on Unshackled. I have no good memories of my family before we broke apart when I was seven. No love was ever expressed in word or in deed. We lived in Michigan where Dad was a truck driver, gone much of the time. At home, he was drunk and violent. Ma was no better, neglecting us kids for her boyfriend. I was closest to my younger sister, Marion. When I was five and she was four, polio struck both of us simultaneously, paralyzed us from the neck down. Marion went home after a year, but I was hospitalized longer. I came home and had to help my older sister take care of the little ones because our parents were mostly gone. Then the court took us kids and my parents divorced. The divorce paper said Dad messed with my younger sisters and had to go into the army or go to jail. After Dad returned from the army, he married again and took Marion and me to live with him. You're going to like your stepmother, Neil. <sighs> Boy, can she cook. Too bad Shirley won't be with us. Uh, she wants to stay at that foster home. One less mouth to feed. 
Marion, it sure is great to leave that juvie home, ain't it? Yeah, I hate that place. One time they made us drink sour milk. Had to sit there till we drank it, didn't we, Marion? Yeah. I drank mine right down, and just as quick, it came right back up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I-, I had to clean up the mess while the matron watched me like a hawk. We had to work in the fields too, Dad. Did they pay you? No. Well, that ain't right. How are you going to buy beer if they don't pay you, huh? Are you going to be on the road again, Dad? Gotta pay the bills, son. Dad didn't pay the bills. He bought beer. Our stepmother beat us when she drank, and she drank a lot. But at least we didn't go hungry. The first summer, we lived in an apartment until Dad quit paying the rent and they evicted us. We drove to my step-grandmother's place in the country. She had a ranch-style house with a full basement, but she wanted no part of us. That old biddy told us to move into the chicken coop. The chicken coop? Yeah. Oh, look at that thing. It ain't fit for humans. The walls are nothing but boards nailed up. Sunlight coming through. Uh, I could drive my truck through some of the cracks between those boards. Who we'll freeze in winter. Well, we can stuff rags in the cracks. It, it stinks in here. Uh, I'll see if she has some shovels and you can help me get the manure out. Dad and I shoveled out the manure and we moved in. That chicken coop was about 10 by 20 feet. And we had two full-size beds on one end, a table and four chairs near the middle, and a metal cabinet with a countertop for dishes. We had a kerosene burner to cook with, but it was no match for Michigan winners. With every blanket piled on, we shivered with cold in bed. Half a mile down the road was a mobile home park, where our big sister, Shirley, lived with foster parents. So we walked to school with her. It's my chicken brother and sister. (laughs) Cluck, cluck. You guys laid any eggs lately? I ain't. Have you, Marion? Nah. I'll bet you hate being cooped up in there. (laughs) Ha ha, very funny. Hey, how come you're hunched over, Neil? Dad got drunk and beat me real bad with a baseball bat on Saturday. He could have killed you. It was a junior-sized bat. I didn't grab the big end or he would have killed me. I hate the way Dad drinks. I'm glad I live with a foster family. You're lucky. You know, I'm thinking of going down to Texas where Mom is. She drinks too. Not like Dad. That year, Shirley ran away from her foster home, and we didn't hear from her for years. Dad moved us to a house close to a cemetery. When he was gone and our stepmother tried to beat us, we ran to the cemetery and hid because she was too afraid to go there. More than once, we slept among the tombstones overnight and walked to school from there. One night, our stepmother brought two men home. We overheard her trying to sell my sister to one of them. So we climbed out our window and ran. Another night, we fled and walked two miles to my uncle's service station. How are we going to get in, Neil? He gave me a key so I could open up when I work on Saturdays. Sure is dark. I'll take you down to the basement and you can sleep down there. Well, it's better than the cemetery. I found some old inner tubes that still had air in them and made a bed for Marion. She was soon fast asleep. Then I went back upstairs to figure out what to do next. It was the middle of the night and a police car came by, saw me inside the locked-up station, and pointed their guns at me. I went out with my hands in the air, told them why we were there, and they took me to my uncle's house. He vouched for me, and we went back to the station and got Marion. Shortly after that, Marion went into foster care, and I didn't see much of her for several years. My aunt and uncle took me in. I had no school records, so I went into the ninth grade based on my age but I had missed so much over the years that I couldn't comprehend the lessons. I quit school when I was 16 and bought a car with money I borrowed from my uncle, money I repaid. My 17th birthday arrived. You want to go into the Navy? Yeah, there's no future for me here. Well, did you talk to a recruiter? I did, and I have to have my parents sign for me, but I don't know where Mom and Dad are. There must be an alternative. The recruiter said we could go before a judge and have you declared my legal guardian... Then you could sign for me. Huh? Let's go. My uncle became my legal guardian, and I joined the Navy three weeks after my 17th birthday. 
I love the Navy. Three square meals a day. Three. And a clean bed every night. My nickname was Meals because I ate more than anyone aboard ship. I came home on leave when I was 19 and Marion called. Her phone call would shake up our world for years to come. Hey, Neil, I hear you're doing great in the Navy. Yeah. How you doing, Marion? I love my foster family. They taught me how to survive in the world, follow the truth, and work hard. Good advice. I've been working ever since Dad quit paying child support. Had to quit school before I graduated. Same here. I called because I heard Margaret wants to get in touch with us. Our, our little sister that was adopted out? Yeah. She got into some trouble, and she's in a home for wayward girls. Where is this place? 80 miles away. My uncle drove us to the home, and we waited in a big, crowded room where Marion ran into an old school friend. Neil, you won't believe this. Penny and I were in the same class together for two years in high school. We chummed around after I went into the foster home. She asked me why we came here, and I told her we're meeting our sister, and we haven't seen her since she was adopted out. And, and she knows our sister? She is our sister! They named her Penny. And you never knew it? Why would I? She was only four when I last saw her. That mini reunion planted the seeds to somehow, someday, find the rest of our siblings. Another sister and two brothers. Meanwhile, I finished my tour in the Navy and came home to live. Shortly after coming home, I met Kitty, a beautiful girl that I wanted to marry as soon as I saw her. How did you survive polio, Neil? I had to learn to walk all over again. I remember being wrapped in hot, heavy blankets twice a day, and the spinal taps were so painful they had to tie us down. You had a rough life, Neil. <laughs> you don't know the half of it, Kitty. The hardest part was when I was seven and the police took me to that juvenile home where they locked me in a basement room. For how long? Mm -hmm. Not sure. Seemed like months. I could see other kids playing outside. It's hard to believe your parents could be so irresponsible. Not nah, just my parents. The ones that ran that home were mean, too. One day a kid hit me in the head with a brick and I ran to the nurse's office. Blood running down my neck. She asked me what happened and when I told her, she hit me so hard I fell and slid under a table. Why? Who knows. If we have kids when we get married, Kitty, you are not going to work. You're going to stay home with the kids. <laughs> Neil... You haven't even talked about love. I don't know what love is, sweetheart. You'll have to teach me, because I've never really known love. After Kitty and I married, I worked for an electrical contractor who taught me the trade and helped me get a journeyman's license. Thanks to the GI Bill, we bought a home where we lived while our three children were born. Five years later, we sold the house and rented a farmhouse, a duplex, shared with the owner who lived in the other half. I wanted to learn farming, and he taught me. Ed was a retired Scottish preacher. The good Lord has examples throughout creation of his love and provision. Think so? God's truth. Look at the miracle of a seed. So small, but packed inside of the instructions and the means to grow into a stock of corn or wheat. I mean, think of it. Have to admit, I never think about that. A seed remains alone, hard as stone, unless it's put into the dark ground and watered. Then it dies to itself, puts out roots and becomes a plant, pushing up into the sunlight. Same is true of us. I don't get it. Jesus said, if it die... It brings forth much fruit. He was speaking of himself and us. Hard to see how something dead can bring forth fruit. It's a miracle, isn't it? God can make rivers in the desert, life where there is none. This farming is hard work, but I love it. Splendid! Just remember, Neil. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Cora invited us to go to church with them on Sunday. You want to go? Doesn't sound like my cup of tea, as, as Ed would say. You ever been to church? No. 
But, yeah, if you sit there and listen to some guy talk at you, who needs that? They're nice people, Neil. And the kids need guidance, so I'm going with them. Well, I have things to do around here, so I'm staying home. That's fine, honey. Some other time. I went with the family to church a few times on special occasions. Less than a year later, Kitty became a Christian. And one by one, as our children grew and understood the gospel, each put his faith in Christ. Three years later, even our youngest boy, who was five years old, chose to follow Jesus. One night, that boy woke us up yelling in fear. The next morning, I sat at the table drinking coffee and smoking my first morning cigarette. Kitty, what in the world was that kid hollering about last night? Joe? He was having a nightmare. He could wake the dead yelling like that. He was scared. A what? Why don't you ask him? He's coming downstairs now. My son feared that the whole family would go to heaven, but I would go to be with the devil. I was horrified. I jumped up and raced off to work, taking back roads so I wouldn't be killed on the expressway. All morning, I was beside myself, feeling the weight of my sins. At lunchtime, I went to an old construction trailer looking for electrical wire. Then I forgot why I was there, and I paced back and forth. Finally, I I dropped to my knees. Jesus, save me. Wow, those words lifted a burden from me. I cannot describe the relief and joy I felt. I was 35 years old, and for the first time since I could remember, tears of joy ran down my face. After work, I went home and walked straight to the barn to unload hay we had bailed earlier. Hello, Neil. In here, Ed. Uh, Oh, uh, Kitty said you were here. What happened today? She said something good happened. That's funny. I didn't even stop by the house. So? So what happened? You're not my best friend anymore. Jesus is. I was saved today. Oh, guy! (laughs) (laughs) That's the best news I've heard in ages. Uh, You know something? Right afterwards, I I held two bags of cigarettes in my hand, and I I asked God to take that filthy habit away from me, and I twisted them up and threw them away. Isn't God wonderful? I've tried to quit a thousand times, Ed. Now it's like I, I never even smoked. After that, I couldn't seem to get enough of God's people. We went to church services, revivals, even took a church bus to Pacific Garden Mission. Kitty and I bought used farm equipment and a few years later bought a farm on contract. I kept my regular job as an electrician but started farming part-time. It didn't take long to realize that plowing until one or two in the morning was too much for me. So we rented out the land to other farmers, and I began a jail ministry that God blessed in amazing ways. I was 57 when my sister Marion visited from California. Two barns, a corn crib, and a big farmhouse. You have quite a spread here, Neil. Even a chicken coop. Don't need to live there with 17 rooms in the house. God has more than made up to you for the past. Best of all, he's using me to reach others. We've seen marriages restored and lives turned around. Lives that looked hopeless, Marion. The Lord is awesome. And this is a great place to live. Yes, it is. We've had baptisms in the creek, potlucks in the yard, and many house guests. We even took a bunch of folks from church to Mississippi for a camp meeting because my van holds 15 people. You could accommodate all our siblings if we could find them. Maybe it's time we looked. Well, Marion and I went to the courthouse today. What'd you learn? That the records are sealed. They wouldn't tell you anything? Not a thing. They answered yes or no to questions, that's all. That, that isn't right. Maybe you should put an ad in the paper. Somebody knows where they are. That's a good idea. We know their birth dates and when they were adopted because Shirley found the paperwork after Mom died. Yeah. Bill and Lucille were adopted together. But if they don't know they were adopted, they wouldn't be looking for you. Shortly after we ran the ad, the law was changed, so we could hire a court-appointed searcher to go into the records and trace people. We did. A few days later, Lucille called. 
she didn't think she was our sister, but we drove more than a hundred miles to visit her. She was our sister, but Lucille had cancer. Two weeks later, she brought Bill and his wife to our farm. By then, Shirley was there too. We planned a family reunion for November. Hello? Hello. I understand you're searching for adopted brothers and sisters? We sure are. We found all but one, our younger brother, Tommy. My son told me about this because I was adopted. But my parents told me I was an only child. They said I didn't have any brothers or sisters. You might be one of seven siblings. Four of you were adopted out in 1941. That's the right year. Tommy was the youngest, born March 1st, 1941. Well, that's my birthday. But I can't be your brother. I, I was an only child. You're welcome to come to the family reunion we're having next week. Uh, I just moved back to Michigan, but I doubt I can make it. The day of the reunion, that man arrived with his wife and daughter. He looked so much like Dad that I thought it was Dad for a moment. But Dad had long since died. We siblings were all together after 50 years. Shortly after that, Lucille died in hospice. And I preached at her funeral. The family was created by God as the best way to nurture children. Satan tried to destroy us, but God turned that to good by adopting us into his family. Scripture says in Psalms 27, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to give us everlasting life. The moment we cry out to him and put our faith in him, we are adopted into God's family. I'm retired now after serving the Lord in many ministries. I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Listening friend, that kind of joyous certainty about the future is for you. God is no respecter of persons, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. But who can say, I have made my heart clean, let alone perfect? All have sinned, and only God can wash away our sin. The price of sin is death. Christ, the Son of God, the perfect man, paid the penalty for you on the cross when he died for your sins. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All you have to do is repent or turn from your sin and ask Christ Jesus to save you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 